little gizmo that he 3D printed that charges your cell phones. Uh, that was pretty awesome, uh, particularly because he it all started at NextFab, and we, a couple of us, are going to NextFab next week to do some maker training, and we're coming back with some 3D printers, and we're going to be putting them here. I'm thinking about writing the window and spotlights on them, <laughs> so they work overnight. People can see. We have to upgrade the glass too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Because it's playable. Cool. <laughs> We'll put it so close that if they break the window, they'll break the printer. That works. <laughs> uh, we'll put the cameras so that everybody thinks that they're being watched. Okay, um, so that was last week. Next week is an intro uh, panel. We're doing a panel on Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is one of those things that I don't really even understand, but it sounds like <laughs> the next huge thing uh, in security. And we have a couple of local experts, so we're going to talk about it. And Andrew Schwab is one, Dana Hoffer is the other, Ryan Finley, who we've had, uh, he's from Philly, he will be a part of it. And I thought we were adding a fourth. No? Um, maybe for upcoming startup meetups? No, for the, the Bitcoin. Um, Patrick Millar, uh, Andrew Schwab, Brian Finley, uh, Dana Hoffer, and there might be one more, so okay. four or five people. Has anybody ever had a Bitcoin in their possession? It wouldn't be in your pocket. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I, think, I think I bought a couple Bitcoins in 2007. I have no idea. Where they are. Because, like, you know, you forget about it, it's in an email address, you don't use it anymore, yeah. and then you hear that they've all been kind of taken over and moved around. Uh, what's more interesting about Bitcoin, I think, is the technology underneath it called blockchain. And that's really, I think, what is the next, uh, is the compelling innovation. Uh, after that, let's do one more. Who's after that? Um, we, um, happy to, uh, we also have y Yakir Gola. He's the founder or co-founder of GoPuff, which is like a um, delivery service for um, all kinds of paraphernalia and uh, munchies. So they have a very targeted market uh, for uh, yeah, the yeah, for a student population that uh, likes to puff on things, um, i.e. no puff. Um, but I wanted to highlight two uh, events that are happening this week that you uh, did mention. Uh, Nada is a co-worker. She's around here somewhere. Nada. Where's Nada? Oh, hi, Nada. Um, and she's an Android developer, and she will be demoing Little Talkers um, tomorrow night uh, from 7 to 10. The demo will probably start at 8. Indie Film Night is on Thursday, and Jesse normally does her Indie Film Night spiel, um, so maybe now is a good time. What do you think? Yes. Okay. Do your Indie Film Night spiel. Yeah. So, um, so this Thursday, super exciting, something brand new for Indie Film Night. We are having a short video showdown. The five teams of students from my advanced video production class at Westchester University will be throwing down their best efforts, including a music video, a satire, um, uh, product promotion, and a, um, what's one of the other ones? It doesn't really matter. It's very fun. All very different. Yeah. So, infomercial, did you say? Yeah, there's an infomercial. I, yeah, they're good. They're, I'm, giving them, I'm even giving them a second pass at editing, too, to really get those things tightened up, too. Um, so we're going to have, Something's Rye Production is doing some sponsorship. We're going to have a red carpet, a step and repeat all lit up. So it's going to be a huge PR um, effort. but. They're all competing for two trophies. There's an audience award, and there is technical merit. We've got an esteemed panel of four judges voting, and then the audience award you get to vote for. Um, and that is Thursday, starts at 7, we'll screen at 8, and then pick the winner. It should probably take an hour for all of that. What else was I going to say? Um, there's red carpet. Oh, and Rams had donated a $100 gift card, which really sweetened the deal. There's a couple of teams that desperately want the $100 gift card <laughs> to buy nutritious food. Yeah. Not to get my 82-year-old mom drunk, like they said. That's not right. That's not appropriate. But yeah, she's going to be here. Um, yeah, so that's going to be on Thursday. And then beer and food. Beer and food, yep. And a good, and a good time. So. Okay, we've been that for a couple of months. Uh, the other event... Uh, we just kicked off a partnership with Unisys, so we're doing a prototyping competition. Yeah. Kind of like a hackathon, but spread across a bunch of Night Owls events. So on April 15th, we're going to have a launch party where you can come and learn about what the details are. But the winning team uh, will win 4000 bucks and probably get to work with Unisys on implementing uh, some element of the idea that they come up vis-a-vis uh, -vis the product that is the focus of the, the prototyping competition. 
So the, the launch party is the 15th, come learn about it, and then decide whether you want to form a team and compete at the four weeks after. So details coming out probably today or tomorrow on our website and through email and social. So we're really excited about that. That's our first big uh, corporate partnership and event. And what's cool about it is when they broached with me the idea of doing a, uh, a prototyping competition and not a hackathon, I was like, oh, I never heard of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay, we'll see how it goes. And it was Peter that said, no, I've heard of that. Uh, I have at least one friend that went to one, and I was like, ah, oh, OK. So <laughs> we're not going to be the guinea pigs. And I volunteered Peter to kind of teach the class or be part of it. And I hope you are going to. All right? Yeah. Can I pay on the spot? <laughs> All right, so that's that. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Fox Rothschild. Terry Kerwin is right there. He's awesome. If you need his legal advice, hit him up. Uh, Brennan's Office Interiors. We have a stand-up desk that goes up and down. That's awesome. Talk to them if you need that. I2N, CCDC, Jim Lochner is representing today. They've been awesome. They're behind this event. They're behind the 3D printers. Uh, they've introduced us to Fox. They introduced us to Brennan's. Um, so, get to know them. Oh, did we just do that live stream? Uh, and then they also introduced us to the Hankin Group. And the Hankin Group runs a co working space for scientists, you know, the kinds that work with chemicals up in Eagleview. So, that's pretty awesome. Um, who else? Igniter TV, also known as Sean Dominsky, doing live streaming onto YouTube. And that reminds me, I wanted to either Meerkat or Periscope this, so I, I might do that in a second. We tried it out last week, and I got six people in uh, watching. So if you don't even know what that means, I'll talk to you after. <sighs> All right, over to you. Uh, tell us your story, and then we'll do Q&A, because these people are hungry to find out how to do it better and uh, details about so let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you for All right, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, to, I'm John Walters. I'm here uh, on behalf of a startup that I'm working on right now called Stock Jock, which is a kind of a, a daily, weekly fantasy stock market game uh, based on really the, the latest trend in, in fantasy sports and trying to adapt that so that people can learn more about the stock market and uh, try to win some money doing it. So uh, really, I first kind of wanted to start off by thanking everybody for having me here today. It's a, it's a really important thing that Walnut Street Labs exists. And there's two things that I'd like to kind of, just kind of w warm everybody up with. The first is that if you're sitting here, you're probably just as far along as I am or further. We're a brand new startup. We're really just getting started. And when you're thinking about that, and in particular the fact that we are in Westchester, in the borough of Westchester, these are all very small businesses. And though whether or not you have lofty ideas and want to contact a million or 100 million people, you're going to have very similar problems to all the people that are right down um, High Street and Gay Street. So um, though I live in Philadelphia, I'm from this area. I went, I went to Shanahan. I live in Exton, or I lived in Exton. And... Um, I find a lot of similarities between the problems with Market Street printing that uh, would have with cruising style as all these other people that are trying to find their market, understand their audience, and uh, build, build a company that can sustain itself. And so uh, really a little bit about, more about myself. Um, I went to uh, Villanova University. While I went to Villanova, I was working um, right down Matlack Street at First National Bank, and I got to see First National Bank change over to one end bank, and then it was Greystone or something before it was finally uh, Susquehanna. And so these were perceived as kind of pr problems, you know, in the area as far as trying to sustain small business and, and, and that. But at the same time, um, to be purchased is something that we all want. We want um, investment, and we want to try to um, make, make something more of, of what we have. And um, with that, I just kind of wanted to say that uh, over the last five years, I've been with eMoney Advisor, which is a firm in Concha Hocken. It helps 
uh, or I guess enhance the advisor client experience. So financial advisors can provide a window for their clients to see where all of their investments are at as well and kind of focus on the short term while they focus on their long term. And that way everybody has kind of the, the best idea of what, what's going on with, with uh, communication, making sure everybody's making the best decisions. And to that end, uh, eMoney Advisor was recently bought by Fidelity Investments, which is um, what was it was a huge deal and w was something that uh, is going to greatly enhance the scope of eMoney Advisor. So it was a, it was a great ride seeing the the problems in early enterprise, and uh, the, you know the, the the growth of the company and all the small problems that would take place, you know, with compliance and, and everything else, making that uh, experience better. And so. Fidelity purchasing them is going to take them to the next level, and they are no longer a startup. So I really can't speak of uh, to that too much as far as, not, as far as my current project, Stock Jock. But uh, you know, we've kind of seen, seen some success happen, and we've been directly part of that. And so we're trying to do that with, with our current project. So once again, so ideology of the beginner, you know. I, I definitely was a little hesitant when Ben invited me here. I mean, I, I absolutely wanted to get in front of you all, but, you know, why, why would I have a right to speak? Because I'm just starting out myself. And so I wanted to kind of, you know, just kind of really express that and talk to the idea of Stock Jock and thinking about, you know, finding a market and then trying to jump out and, and go for it in that market. When I, was, uh, when I was in college, uh, I had to take a semester off from school to uh, you know, save up some extra money to go back. And so I was working at First National Bank of Chester County. And then for the first time in my life, I had a chunk of 2,500 bucks. And I was going to buy a, a base amp. I, I, was, I was really <laughs> excited about it. I, uh, you know, I kind of had it picked out. I was looking at it. I wanted to have uh, you know, SWR speakers and a really nice uh, head unit. and. Uh, uh, a buddy gives me a call, and he had been working at the, uh, the Renaissance Fair. I can't remember where it is, but it's out in, in Lancaster. And he's like, listen, man, we got to make crepes. And I'm, I'm thinking, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? I think I had mentioned to him that I had, like, you know, I had, I had saved a little nest egg. And, he's, <laughs> and so we, he, he, had talked about, he had talked to me. Um, he, was, uh, you know, he was in the, the business club at Cabrini College, and he was talking to me about how uh, our, our, friend, our friend of ours' father had this nuts about you company where he sold nuts, but they also did crepes. And he'd said, the crepes are the ticket. We need to go around. We need to sell crepes. And uh, we're going to create a uh, small catering company that does festivals and things like that. And so three months later, we, I started the, the mainline crepe company. And so we, we went around, and on weekends, what we would do is we'd find people where we could do parties. We did the Kennett Square Mushroom Festival, and we had some initial success. And uh, the Kennett Square Mushroom Festival was the, the, the best example because we, we had gone in, it was hard work, it was all day long, and we were in the black after our first festival. All of our initial investment was back, and so everything was, everything was going fantastic. But uh, so then, a couple of weekends later, we decide, all right, we're just looking at festivals and trying to you know, do this DIY, and we go to the Lake Wallen Paul Peck Bluegrass Festival. Well, as you can imagine, the people in Kennett Square can get excited about crepes. The people at Lake Wall and Paul Peck, if you don't know, is in a little bit of upstate Pennsylvania, are like, what you got in them craps? I don't want any of them craps. You know, and so uh, horrible experience. We're sleeping in a tent. We got to listen to some great music. And, uh, you know, but we, we let what we thought would be a great experience with the music kind of trump what we were trying to accomplish and who we were trying to accomplish it with. So that was a definitely an example of not thinking the, the market through. But um, it, was a, you know, it was a really fun experience. It was something that was kind of unsustainable without really going for it and just doing festivals all, all year long. But we'd kind of realized exactly what that, um, what that pinnacle would be. And we kind of you know, ducked out before, before we, got, we, got, we got too involved. Um, and from there, uh, I had an experience. Uh, selling life insurance for Northwestern Mutual. And I thought I would, I would be, it would be in a great, great market. I just graduated in 2008. And nobody wanted to take advice from somebody who just graduated from college, dealing with their finances, who's 24 years old. So it was uh, one of those things where you, you'd go meet with people. And a lot of the people I'm meeting are also 24 or 26. And they're just, in their minds, they're, they're never going to pass away. They are not invested in 
all of the, the, the kind of the, the timing in your life for the specific products. So though that was an extremely valuable experience, and I, I learned a heck of a lot, Northwestern Mutual I think is a fantastic company. They just acquired um, LearnVest, which is a company that I, uh, I've always kept my eye on because I think they're brilliant marketers, so perfect fit for the quiet company. But um, from, uh, from, from my personal experience though, um, I, I just, uh, I, you know, I, I had a product that I, I believed in, but I was unable to kind of reach the audience that I needed to reach in order to kind of sustain that um, even initial success that I had uh, had there. And that led me to uh, eMoney Advisor. And with eMoney, when I came in, I was employee number 76. Now I believe that there's nearing 300 employees. The goal is 500 employees now that we have our new investment from uh, Fidelity. And uh, it, it's a, a wild ride. That was a, more of a subscription-based product. So the dynamic of that is, is, is much different than you know, a product that you'd have just once. Um, but once again, it's still it's all about timing. Because you know, uh, with especially financial advisories, uh, it's, a, it's, a very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very kind of uh, immersive career. And when you're spending time meeting with your clients, you have to make sure that you can put aside the time and effort that it takes to get clients on board with the platform in a way that is conducive with your business hours. So really the challenge with, with eMoney, and in my personal experience, I would, uh, I, would, I would meet with financial advisors all day long, or they'd send me to trainings uh, around the United States. And uh, a lot of the times it was, you know, timing. Is, you know, am I going to be able to begin this product right after tax season? If my pro if my uh, practice is really engaged with things like that, so uh, they've had a lot of success. And I don't mean to kind of go off on a, a tangent about them, but um, as far as finding your market goes, that that's something that uh, can be important. But when it, we think about you know finding finding your drive and, and what really kind of gets you going, um, though that's really a, a personal journey, you really kind of have to think about. You know, what are your goals? How can you realize those goals? And what can you do every day just so that you know, you're kind of sus sustaining yourself and, and making sure that you can do that? So um, with the Stock Jock project, uh, it began, it really it be it began a, a number of years ago. And there was a company that came out. And I'd become a little bit discouraged that somebody kind of uh, started to do it. They're called Invoost. And they were a company that uh, was actually based in uh, Spain and New York City. And so what happened is that they had had some initial success. The idea was that you'd get a very similar to the other stock market games that are out there. And if you if you look, there's a ton of games. A lot of them are very sophisticated. And they'll give you a fantasy portfolio. And you can reinvest that portfolio and make trades all day long. Um, well, what happened is that I started to stop seeing the news uh, about Invoost. And uh, I finally, I had gotten into the demo and tried to play it. And I realized that it was really, they were doing what everybody else was doing, only you could earn real money. And the idea was that you have this big million dollar portfolio and you can make trades and, and do that. But one of the things that I've learned from dealing with financial advisors is that managing a $1 million pure stock portfolio is an all time job. Uh, yeah, is all really, you're going to be doing it all day long. And so the idea of doing that for two days and winning $16 or even 300 bucks, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily realistic. And so what our focus is with Stock Jock is to give people a way in the door and learn about the, the volatility and the risk of the stock market on an individual basis of what stocks are and how the general economy works. And uh, that was different than what Invoost had uh, been doing. So essentially, there was a point where I was like, you know what, they're doing it wrong. I want to do this, and I'm going to do this. So I had... Uh, Talked to uh, kind of a, a men mentor of mine, somebody who had left eMoney, but it inv in invented that initial framework that eMoney sits on top of. And they had introduced me to my partner, Christian Heinzman, who is one of the, the lead developers with the data aggregation. He's uh, developed probably half of eMoney's data aggregation that aggregates uh, over a trillion dollars every single night from various financial institutions. And so um, in meeting with Christian, he was interested in the idea. We, we met with Ben and uh, did the... Philly Startup Weekend. Uh, we had a, a successful experience there. We came in second place, which uh, you know re really bugged us. But uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, we 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 had a really good time, and uh, we we decided that we'd kind of we'd begun we'd begun to validate our idea. 
So we think that there, there's something there. And so in continually trying to incrementally kind of validate our, our idea, um, make sure that everything's succinct and everybody's on the same page, um, we've, we've, worked, uh, we've worked very hard just to try to uh, you know, cook out the idea, meet as many people as possible, and really um, that's why I'm here today. So uh, I guess a couple of final notes about Stock Jock. We are trying to kind of change the way that these, these stock market games work. Because essentially, the way that most of them work, as I mentioned before, is that you get this big portfolio and you try to do that. And what we're trying to do is introduce people to what it is about the economy that they're, they're trying to understand, what it is about the market that they're trying to get into. And that is you know, brands and companies that they understand. So we're trying to help people understand individual um, individual stocks and companies, and we're looking at more of the what's been successful with fantasy sports, which is you build a roster of stocks, not necessarily a portfolio with numerous shares, and you see how you do against uh, your competitors. So we're trying to bring you know Wall Street to Main Street, combine the thrill and excitement of fantasy sports with the uh, you know the the risk and and uh, activity in the stock market. All right, everybody. So that's, that's mo most of what I had to offer you. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good, I have a question. Sure. House rules. Oh, okay. Name, who you are, any questions? Uh, Mary Lasota, I'm a tax attorney. Hey. Um, question, uh, are you thinking about marketing your product to high schools and universities? Because in my high school back in the day, that was exactly what we had to do. We had to pick out stocks. Yeah. And we had a track to set stocks over the semester. And, I'm look, and unfortunately, we had a, you know, back before the internet was even developed, we had to go to the New York Times and pull out all the daily stocks uh, for what they were from the day before. So are you thinking about marketing this as an educational tool to high schools and universities? Uh, yes. yes we, well, well, long story. Yes, it's, it's not our. <laughs> so, uh, well, the, see that there's uh, there's what we're trying to do first is we're trying to market it to the individuals where we believe that we will find the most traction immediately. And so, because you, uh, this will work like the daily, weekly fantasy sports, whereas you, you pay a few bucks to play, and at the end of the market close, daily, weekly, or monthly you would be able to uh, have a payout if you fit within that graduated uh, score. Um, so first what we're going to do is we're going to try to be directly uh, B to C. Now, the thing is that some people are, some people are encouraged to win, to win cash, and other people just want to place and have kind of notoriety based on how they place. And so we can also have either anonymous games or games that would be conducive to kind of universities and and such that would be, you, you know, you're just trying to place in a specific um, percentile. And it would be based, I guess, on the, how they, the university decided to reward the student on that. But uh, we, we thought about marketing in a number of different ways because um, essentially when, when you win at Stock Jock, if you win a certain amount of money, um, that money could certainly go somewhere. So it could go into your pocket or it could be reinvested into um, a brokerage account that you could start. So as a, as a beginner getting to know the stock market, it could be that initial investment. Um, part, of the, part of the kind of angst and uh, problem that I, I'm trying to solve here, I didn't really get a chance to speak to that so much um, in, in the presentation, but I had tried to set up a brokerage account myself, and I mean, keep in mind, I work at eMoney Advisor, my wife and I, we definitely, you know, we, we, we try to do our best to save and, and do, do what we can. And uh, setting up a brokerage account was just god awful with all of the red tape and everything. Especially if, you know, I had had that. Uh, now I, I, when I save money, I have little pockets of money that, you know, it's not that my wife doesn't know about it, but it's like it's mine. And so when I get that, I, I wanted to have a, a small amount of money that I would, I would put away in an E-Trade account, and I would, you know, just have as just a, a general, not necessarily savings, but for my own edification and everything, I'd be able to kind of uh, use that. Um, so I'd set up an E-Trade account. And I had to save for a couple of weeks before I'd be able to get even a single share of like a, a nice stock, you know. And so the problem with that is that, it, especially with something like E-Trade, if you don't use money within, a, I think it's a 30-day period, it might be a 60-day period, they send, you the, they send you a check because you can't, it can't just sit there. 
And so I'm on eMoney Advisor every single day. I, I follow all of my accounts, even though that, you know it's really I'm I'm tr hoping that my net worth will someday see above above water, you know. But uh, really, uh, the idea is that uh, my eTrade account had a big goose egg, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I've got some money in there, so. I couldn't figure out from the chat feature on E-Trade or what happened until I get this check in the mail. And now I'm thinking, all I wanted to do was play around with some stocks. And you know, I, I can't do that. I'm priced out of the market. And uh, there's got to be a way that I could, I could play this, but not with a million dollar portfolio. Just you know, learn a little bit about how companies behave, how volatility and risk works, and how you can see kind of the like behavior and how news affects um, the stock market. Because there's tons of informed people um, that just don't have access. Yeah. Jim Walker, Peak Legal Group. Um, walk, walk me through how it, like, I mean, the overall concept, how it works. I mean, is there an initial investment in order to get in? Is there, you know, five dollar, ten dollars to get in, take a look at it, and then move from there? Uh, yeah. So essentially, uh, the the way that it works, and we're still very much in kind of like a, a beta phase. Sure. We're, we're trying to. Uh, we we have, we have a big conference in May, and then we're going to try to. Uh, you know, this is more like conceptualization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So the idea is that you log in, you fund your account. It could be you know ten bucks, could be five hundred bucks, and you would be able to uh, play games. Initially, what we want to do during the setup process is that you you log in, you create your username, you put in maybe your address, or any information that we have to have because this is going to be a state to state um, validation, and so. Um, you pick three stocks, and what we would do is we would tell you how those three stocks performed over the last couple of days. Where in the last five games we've had, you would have um, had winners or losers. Then what you'd be able to do is you, you'd come to a platform where you're going to be able to choose your games. There's going to be pools of people, a number of different types of games. Um, you'd be able to select your game, and you'd essentially pick uh, a roster based on certain criteria of stocks. And then um, it would have to be in before market open and you'd see how you perform by market close. Um, so it's different than the traditional trading platforms. Um, however, we do anticipate having trading platform games. But we really want to be kind of the, we want to be the, the Flintstone vitamins of your education in the stock market. We have, we're, so it'll be checkers more than it'll be uh, chess. I want to make sure we're with all this. But you, you were saying uh, that you won something afterwards. How, how do you bring in the reward part of your of your platform? Right? Sure. Well, so so essentially, when when you enter a game, um, you're paying to play a game. So there's going to be an entry for each game that you participate in, unless there are free games. Because if we were going to like enterprise or whatever. But in, the, in the, the general version of the white website, you you you, you put in your entry fee. You would set your picks and you'd find out how they perform within the day. And a certain number of people would win um, in each game, and a certain number of people would lose. Now, is this comprehensive as far as the stocks, how it relates to real time, real market, et cetera, or is it more along the lines of you guys are setting the rules and <clears throat> here are the stocks, here are the portfolios you can choose from. Not every product or vehicle is offered. Yeah, we're, we're gonna start off with uh, US, US only stocks. Okay, so and, and, and so, yeah, 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 and so, the idea is that eventually we want to be able to, uh, like you know, we have we have friends that are developers in a number of different countries and stuff, and we'd love to have you know you can do the DAX after the you know or if you wake up really early. I guess really it would be the Asian markets for us here in the United States, but uh, there could be different games for different people at different times, and there's going to be a skill level or just basic understanding level that you don't want to start out with other markets. So it's going to start out with U.S. markets, and you'd, you'd, you'd have to pick various kind of sectors and um, size. Are you first? Uh, Kyle Hudson, 23 North Digital, hey. uh, and an avid gamer. And I just see, um, like, let's say my brother, who actually works on Wall Street, he's very well versed in the stock market and everything like that. Let's say we wanted to play. I would assume he would have a natural advantage knowing the stock market more than I do. So if there's money at stake, are you worried that people who have, like, people are going to go to the ones that they're going to win? That they have the most likelihood of winning. So, are you worried about people that are in the industry coming and in making some, you know, some quick money on this, and then not allowing people to that are coming in? Like, are you going to have some yeah, sort yeah, of there's, matchmaking? There's, like, yeah, we want to. Uh, like, like I said, we we and, and eventually we want to have you know beginners, intermediate, and and kind of advanced games. Now, there's not a way to just cut everybody out, and initially we are trying to. 
get uh, get people using our site. So ideally, we're we're starting out going for people that would use it, not necessarily worried about um, who would win and who would lose. And, and also, in the the fantasy gaming markets, you have to prove that people with uh, more knowledge, uh, you know, perform better than people with less knowledge. However, um, in beginning games, we were thinking of setting thresholds as your username has won X dollars, therefore you can only perform in the intermediate yeah. level. So there, there's going to be checks and balances, but initially um, you have to, the, the, the whole basis is it's, it's, it's risk. You're, you're uh, performing against pockets of people, which is probably harder than, or easier than performing against the market itself. But uh, that, that's what we anticipate. I was, okay, sorry. Go ahead. Quick question. Uh, are you aware of what the SEC just did in terms of crowdsourcing, um, like a week ago, are you familiar with, you know what I'm talking uh, about? You so to invest in a startup, you okay. have to be an accredited investor, and they lowered that hurdle, I think, to allow anybody to invest um, <laughs> to a certain degree sure. uh, without having that accreditation. And so what would be really interesting is if you flip this from uh, public markets to private companies where people could put in 50 or 150 or do Kickstarter but for equity if you thought yeah, about we've, that. Uh, we, we're, we're beginning to do that. You know, first, uh, and it, you know, really, uh, yeah, we're, we're beginning to think about things like that. Can anyone clarify? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I couldn't do that for what his model is because he, what he wants is a daily or weekly or monthly number and you really, really can't get a value yeah, for the, for the startup company, so that's your problem. It's a long, mm -hmm. much longer term. Yeah, thing. yeah, that you're right. You're looking for. I think the concept is good that people understand that, but that goes away from this model. Yeah. But are you yeah. familiar with what happened with SEC last week? I know they've been working on it. I didn't, I didn't see that they passed. Yeah, it. like two days ago, everything on the uh, uh, BC well, and seed funding people came out like nuts. Yeah, and, I mean, and that would also be a very specialized audience where it could be cool in uh, certain scenarios. Uh, we're going to be at the. Collision Conference uh, in, in May, and one of the things that we were thinking about was having a stock drop based on only those companies and seeing the behavior, if there was any short-term <coughs> changes or a way that we could have metrics around the progress that people were having. Okay, David. Yeah, uh, David Chopko, investment banker slash college pre professor, I don't know which one. Um, uh, one, can you tell me well, exactly who is your target market for this, and two, how are you going to make money for it? And then three, let's take it to what's happening right now, which is NCAA basketball. I put in 20 bucks into a pool. If I put in 20 bucks into that pool, I'm looking at getting X percent of that money back. In fact, typically you get all of it back because nobody's taking a cut out of the thing. But if you have 1,000 people in the thing, you're going to get you know, $20,000 back. If you end up with 10 people in the thing, you're going to get $200 back. How are you guys going to decide are you going to take X percent of it back, or you can have all those rules. Yeah. How does that work? <clears throat> all right. Well, in order for this to be, uh, in order to, to do any types of fantasy gaming, you have to publicly have a, a benchmark of how many people are in this game, um, what are the placings that would, would earn a prize, and what, exactly how much money those, those, those places have. So that will all be posted on the site from the start to the finish of the, the games. Um, Naturally, if we're taking a, 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 we can't take a fixed percentage of games when people could be playing one dollar or uh, twenty dollars or fifty dollars. So there's going to be a graduated percentage that would uh, that, that we are in the process of defining and working out um, based on different kinds of games. What games are people playing so that we can sustain ourselves as a company? Um, and uh, right now, actually, we're in the we're in the end of week two of our NCAA game. So, like I said, it's a uh, we're taking a, a different look at the way that people are kind of learning about the stock market and kind of playing games around the stock market. So I'm not sure uh, if Ben wants to uh, kind of, um, if you uh, should click a login and then click, uh, just click Google. Oh wait, it's not my computer. Oh. All right, yeah, do it anyway, if you don't mind. We're gonna get Ben signed up. So uh, right now we're having a game where, you know, and, and, and trying to get the layperson to kind of be interested in the stock market. We, uh, we're, we're having a game that's based on different tiers of sponsors of the NCAA tournament. So, you know, the NCAA tournament has, has, has posted um, different levels of sponsorship that certain companies have had. And if you, um, I guess we're going to have to, uh, 
this might we might not be able to do that yeah, in, in today's uh, example. So um, right now you could pick, you know, tier one would be maybe all state, tier two might be uh, Nabisco, which is Kraft Foods who had a great right. week last week. Um, and also, you know, the, the teams are the, the companies that have provided uniforms for the teams. So any publicly traded team or sponsors of the tournament we've got listed, and you can pick different tiers and determine how you're going to do against your peers. Uh, right now we get all of our data from uh, Yahoo. Uh, we're, we are kind of in the process of shopping around for a, uh, a nice data feed. There's a couple of options that are out there for us, but uh, right now we're going with free data. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, who's your target? Who's your uh, and that's, that's, and that's the question. Okay, okay, people, so people of this brand, you can't advertise, you can't promote to something right. that's broad. And so, and so right now we're experimenting with traction and trying to find out where we can get our traction. So we've been doing Facebook ads. Um, we haven't started Twitter ads. I think we might start that just because Twitter is uh, we're starting to get more traction there than we're getting on. Uh, on Facebook in particular, but with the ads, what we anticipated was people that play fantasy sport games are between 18 and uh, 25 generally, is like the largest concentration of people that play fantasy sports games. Uh, as far as our ads have been going, we actually have done best between with people between 35 and 55, and in particular women between 35 and 55. And so we believe that that traction point might be because right now we're at a, you know, a point in the United States where people need to concentrate harder on what are investments, how do you learn about the way that uh, the, the market works, and really that's at the, the ground floor. So we want to be uh, an avenue there, and we want to have strong, um, understandable market research. In the back. Okay. Dan Rosenthal, Displaced Beach Bum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the um, question I have is a lot of games like NCAA's, the winner is typically somebody who chooses something out of the just kind of, you know, just way off. And what you're trying to do is educate people to make wise investments. So you see your portfolio of $10,000 grow up gradually to $11,000. Uh, how do you limit the amount of stocks available? Do you have a criteria? Or, yeah, How do you read that in so, you don't so, have so, so just to kind of uh, fill everybody in too, the way that, uh, that some, a lot of the, these fantasy games work is that you know you pick quarterback, and so there you have a list of the quarterbacks, and so we might we're going to try to have um, we're we're trying to have games that are topical and then just general games, and so there was essentially going to be you know pick a large cap stock, pick something that's in the, the you know the Dow, or pick something that's uh, in, the, in the tech, and we'd probably be top 100 stocks. So, I mean, to answer your question, um, one of our fa favorite apps from a, um, just basically a, a user interface with stock market information is Stock Touch. We were big fans of uh, Stock Touch. So it's going to show, you know, kind of where, where the position is, how they've been performing based on the, the, the color and how, how vibrant it is. And we would definitely limit it to the people in the top 100. Now, 100 can be a ton of, yeah, that's a ton of choices. And so, I, you know, we, one of our challenges is going to be, how do you make it so that somebody can set their game in place and be playing it within 10, 15 minutes instead of 45 minutes or, you know, just getting discouraged and leaving the city. Next question. Yeah, I was uh, just curious on, um, are you using algorithms to uh, determine how the stocks are being influenced by outside market factors? How are, where, where is this information coming from? Is it coming from the New York Stock Exchange that you're tying it in? Right, so yeah. that the stocks are responding equal, you know? Yeah, yeah. Right, right now, all of our information is coming from uh, Yaka, Yaka Finance. Um, we're not, we're, we're trying to, like, like currently we have a number of different demo games, so the first couple were general and right now we're putting out a weekly game based on um, what time of the year it is or what, uh, what something that's going on in the news and how you can tie the news to the, um, to the game. So we don't have um, algorithms as much as, you know, our, our, just our research of what we're offering. So right now um, the stocks that you can choose from in every different position are really between 3 and 10. It's not, you know, being able to have that open general, you type in the ticker and you can see a list of um, people that fit that specific letter criteria. So right now it's, you know, it's small groups of stocks where the, the historical information is right there to, to check. And uh, we're getting all of that from Yahoo. So I'm Jim Breslin, Westchester Story Slam. You kind of alluded to, but I'm not sure, 
Can it, are you able to play the game without paying but without winning? You mentioned uh, like we, maybe. Well, is there a free version to get people in the door? We we would like to. Uh, we, we haven't um, we haven't thought of doing doing that necessarily right now. All the games are free, and you can win they five dollars. Yeah, and so so we're really before executing the, the, the actual product. So our MVP is really just um, you know you, you pick five or eight stocks. They're all listed there, and uh, if you win, you can you can win a small cash value prize. The winner of the, the three week NCW tournament is twenty five dollars for us. But uh, the the idea of the free games we've been thinking about really more in terms of uh, if we enterprised it to an institution that just wanted to keep people on their sites, so they wanted to have a kind of a compelling um, reason to do so. Uh, how big is your team? Uh, right now our team is uh, three people. And it's, uh, it's, it's myself, Christian, and uh, um, somebody who's going to be assisting us, uh, Dan, Dan Riley, who's going to be assisting us in Las Vegas for the Collision Conference. And what are the, the functions of those um, three people? Really, really, I'm kind of the, uh, I guess, the chief executive just trying to make, make everything happen, focusing on marketing and getting the word out, as well as uh, I create all of the games currently. Uh, Christian is the developer. He's uh, focused on um, doing analytics with uh, the, the website, creating the website, and uh, just trying to uh, keep everything in check. Christian's a very even-kilter even guy, so where, where I'm more of the, uh, I guess, uh, the outgoing, kind of uh, emotionally driven guy. He's the, he's the stone-faced um, this, this is what this is why we're doing. Yeah, he's full stack developer. Uh, third person, and that is uh, Dan Riley. He's kind of our our street team more than anything else. So right now he's uh, uh, he's uh, he's going to assist us uh, with the uh, with the collision conference and uh, to a, a number of different capacities, uh, primarily uh, face to face marketing. Uh, and what is the collision conference? Uh, that's going to be a that's a, a conference that is held in uh, Las Vegas. This is actually only the, the second one, so it's not something that is um, very established. But it allows uh, small companies to collide with larger companies, so that we can um, try to uh, seek some mentorship, market research, and uh, possible um, capital. Is it around gaming or just in general? Uh, it's actually it's around I think uh, all, all different types of tech startups. And uh, it's, it's, it's actually a European conference that's uh, establishing itself in the United States. And when were you founded? We were founded in October of 2015. Not 14. <laughs> 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 the future. The future. <laughs> and um, what other kinds of events like this have you done? Are you, do you trying uh, to speak done, about your, your startup? Yeah, right, right, right now we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to speak as much as possible and just get some uh, just get some you know, time under our belts and establish uh, as much as we can on the, on the site itself and uh, you know, you got the idea. Um, we, we attend a number of technically Philly events. That's a, we, we go to a lot of those type things. I'm going to uh, volunteer at the Entrepreneur Startup in uh, April 22nd so that we can kind of get a leg up on you know, what, where are going to be some best practices and how we can have the most impact. Okay. Steve Ritchie, I do digital and direct marketing. Um, you've got a certain number of people. How large is your audience? And have um, you work through sure. to find your, the influencers in that? Are you using any models for uh, We are. We, we, we are. Uh, we're trying to work. We, we also we're trying to work with Drexel and Villanova University, who have been very helpful. Um, trying to provide us uh, with different resources and uh, connections. We uh, right now we have uh, an email list of registrations of about 50 people. Um, of that, we have uh, every and every week when we put out our games, we have about a 44 percent open rate, and so we're, we're working with that. Um, I can't speak enough to our st uh, analytics with uh, Facebook and with the going to the actual site, but we've gotten some traction uh, more so, I would say, on Twitter than on, on Facebook. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, we also have uh, we have 19. Uh, like I, I would say. Uh, 10 to 19 people that play the game every week, that participate in the, the ongoing games. And uh, right. word of mouth as well as uh, uh, you know, our advertisements. Okay, two more questions, Ben? I have two questions, but you can have this one. 
<laughs> so we can give someone else a chance. Um, so I obviously have kind of an insider scoop, and this may sound like a pointed question, but what did, uh, what did you learn um, at Startup Weekend? Because I learned a ton. Um, and what did it teach you about founding a company and working with a team? Um, really just how exciting and uh, way to... There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, really, what Startup Weekend kind of meant to me and what I got out of it was just uh, how excellent it is working in a small team and what you can really, how much progress you can get when you put your mind to it in just a 72 hour period of time. Um, what, what we did is we, we, I think we ended up getting over 100 street surveys and 100 surveys um, from SurveyMonkey on that, whether or not people were uh, intimidated by the stock market. We, we did some research into, I think there was a, a Schwab finding last year that found that um, Though 60, 60 odd percentage of, uh, of people that make between $35,000 and $75,000 $75, a year um, are interested in the stock market but don't invest. And uh, you know, just a, a number of key facts. We would try to uh, really just uh, make something out of, make something out of uh, virtually nothing. And I think we succeeded in doing so, so far. Um, I'll follow up, doesn't count as a second question. <laughs> yeah. um, your ethos is, and again, I kind of understand it maybe more than someone else that you pull off the street because I helped um, kind of like um, launch it or whatever, um, was, you know, we make stocks fun and the game um, could probably always be more fun because stocks are inherently maybe dry and not so fun. And that, that's what is um, maybe deters people from to, um, going into stock market trading and uh, real stock market trading. So are, do you have any kind of future visions for how to make uh, these games even more fun and really like gamey? And yeah, well that, that's something that we were really trying to work on from like an analytic standpoint. You know, what, which games will have received the, the best reception, which games were actually interesting, and which were idea, failed ideas that we thought might be interesting. And uh, essentially, uh, one thing that, one thing that, like you said, is that stocks. A lot of times, when, when you're looking at stock market data, it's as dry as possible. Um, when when you're trying to research it, a lot of times you're looking at information that was meant for your financial advisor or a stockbroker to, to look at. They see their key statistic and they go. And so, um, a number of institutions now. If you, if you research, they, they'll put ads up or they'll even say whether or not it's a bull or a bear based on how it's performed over the last couple of weeks. But it's not necessarily um, telling you enough about what that company is and what they do. And so, you know, for instance, uh, just to use a little bit of a cliche example, you know, mm -hmm. Warren Buffett says that never to buy stock in a company that you wouldn't purchase the whole company if you had the resources. And so the thing is that we all have these um, uh, emotional ties to all of these companies that make up the entire stock market. And so when you look at stock market data, you don't see it. And a lot of times we'll see these trees that a lot of times will have almost a negative connotation of, you know, these big companies own all of these little companies, when in reality, you know, I love some of these companies. And so by extension, I, you know, I'm interested in maybe this, this stock position where now I can see how this stock is diversified this whole uh, number of brands. And so, when one is uh, not doing so well, you know, I can affect others. Uh, yeah, we're trying to make informed people have more access and uh, understand it a little better. Okay. Wayne on uh, motion picture production. All these games, it seems like they're fairly short term in the sense that the more games you have, the more money you make, but it seems like a short term outlet or outlook is not uh, necessarily a good thing. It certainly isn't. A Investing. Yes, and, uh, and let me be the first one to say out loud and in public, this is not investing. So the idea is that this is, can give you just a, uh, you know, you can go and test your knowledge and, you know, even if you lose, you lose five bucks and not, well, I bought this stock for a thousand dollars and now it's worth nothing. Um, or I put ten thousand dollars into penny stocks, which is what a lot of people do when they try to get in and that's even on a exponentially level more, more dangerous than uh, what this could be. So, so this is, this is short-term, and uh, I'm not, we're not trying to get people to develop bad habits, because essentially what you want to do is you want to be able to sustain, sustain the ups and downs. But uh, this is just purely uh, a game. 
Well, you, you could sell leads to the brokerage houses. Like, if you're doing well, then maybe you want to consider opening up an account at E-Trade. Right, right. And, and, and the pure trading kinds of games could be used as a, uh, um, as a recruiting tool. Yeah. Um, or, you know, a marketing funnel as well. I'm just wondering about the term game versus learning tool or fun learning tool because game makes it sound short term. Whereas well, well it, it, it is, and uh, the, the educational element is a little bit more of a residual benefit than it is uh, the, the, the pure, um, um, uh, I guess, a locus of, of what it's meant to be. Okay, yeah. Yeah, let's do one more question and we can ask uh, John questions after we wrap up. This isn't a question, this is actually a, something that I learned. There was a gentleman who unfortunately recently passed away from our area who was brought in right at the beginning of Shark Tank. And he, um, they asked him, um, do you have any companies that you can bring forth? And the type of companies that he was dealing with were something like maybe even Chris is working on right now. And the, the, he said, you don't want to see the companies that I'm working with because your audience can't quickly understand them. You may look, you may end up limiting your offerings to companies that have products that the average person can easily understand. I like I look on your book and your board right there. Most people don't know what Capital One Financial Corp. Okay? Right. So but they do know what Burger King does. Yeah. So if you were to limit your stock picks to companies that have products that the average person can easily understand, I think you'll find the traction will get will increase rather dramatically. Yeah. I, I, yeah thank you. And uh, I think that uh, that's that's really the, the, the idea is that we want to have an emotional connection with people or tie an emotional connection to brands that they are familiar with. So it's not Northrop Grumman and they don't know what's going on with uh, different types of kinds of stuff. All right. Well, thanks a lot for coming. All right. Thank you all. It's really a pleasure to be here.